Can you see our screen? Yes. yes. Okay. Why does it say record? Should we, should we get everybody to mute? Uh, I, uh, yeah, why don't we, uh, uh, why don't we do that? Mute. So if everyone can mute or I'll mute you. Uh, if you mute everyone, uh, leave, leave me. Uh, <laughs> right. No, I know. <laughs> yeah. Pam, Alice Stickney just came in plus maybe somebody else. Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone. This is our fifth anniversary celebration and combined uh, with our annual meeting. Our program for today uh, will be a, a quick introduction and then we have a speaker, Pazit Aviv, our annual report and we will have, a, have two times when we have uh, what we're calling door prizes, even though <clears throat> there's no door involved. And we will have a poll um, that I think you might enjoy. So right now, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. This is a new adventure for us. And I hope you'll be patient because uh, oh, we, we're new at this. Uh, in order to avoid background noise, we are uh, hoping that everyone will mute or we will mute you, but uh, feel free to unmute yourself and even more important, use the chat uh, ability. Uh, we'll uh, be collecting your questions or comments in the chat room and at certain times we'll go through them and give you, give you an opportunity to be heard. So I hope that will work for you. I'd like to quickly introduce uh, our staff and our uh, steering committee members. So let me go back to uh, our view and uh, ask the people that I introduce to speak so that we, we they're highlighted for us. Our program director, you probably are very familiar with because a lot of us have almost daily contact with her and that's Joy Klein. Hello. <laughs> uh, and uh, is uh, Brenda here today? Okay, uh, then let me just quickly introduce our steering committee. I'm Barbara Lando, I'm the uh, chairman this year. Our vice chairman is Marianne Borkert. Hi everybody. Good to see so many here. Our uh, secretary is Nan Myers. Hello, everybody. Our treasurer, Reba Dupra. And Reba is muted. Uh, I hope you can un unmute Reba. There. Okay. okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Because we'll need you later. Uh, and then the other uh, members are Vera Alexander. I don't know if Vera is here yet. Uh, Donna Dinsmore. Uh, Marvin Falk. Hello. Mary Matthews. Hello, hello. Great to see the faces behind and behind the names or the names behind the faces. Not sure which it is. Uh, <laughs> Judy Triplehorn. Saw her. Uh, she is, is here, but uh, she usually, um, in order to save her bandwidth, doesn't appear. Uh, okay, and uh, Pam Wagaman. Hi. Uh, that's our steering committee members, plus uh, Joy, who always joins us as a non-voting member, and it's kind of important to be there, too. <laughs> uh, I'm glad that we had this chance for you to see everyone. Please feel free to contact any of us if you have suggestions or comments. We'd love to hear from you. And we, we are very responsive to um, 
your, your suggestions, I assure you. Okay, um, I'd like to pass the speakership on to Ariba Dupra, who will introduce our speaker for today. Thank you. Um, Barbara, could you go back to our slides, please? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, we're very happy today to welcome Pazit Aviv, who is uh, on the um, board of directors of the Village to Village Network. And her regular job, which keeps her real busy, is that she's village coordinator uh, for the Montgomery County, Maryland area aging, or agency on aging. And um, in addition to dealing with uh, startup and growth of villages, she also has a specialty in dealing with um, aging and disabilities. One of Pazit's top priorities is capacity building for aging in place in diverse communities. And she holds a master's in social work degree from Salem State University with a special focus on aging and end of life care. Uh, Pazit's a great speaker. Some of us heard her at the Village to Village Network uh, annual meeting, which we attended virtually this fall. And uh, we're really interested in the insights that she has had to share uh, about seniors and uh, aging in place and how seniors contribute to uh, communities and neighborhoods. And um, Pazit will use the word villages probably quite a bit, but the context is a little different um, than what we're familiar with in Alaska. In Alaska, when we think of villages, we often think of Alaskan rural villages, um, but Pazit is thinking of organizations like our Aging and Home Fairbanks, organizations um, which help seniors with aging in place. Um, and as Barbara said, uh, if you have questions as Pazit is talking, I'll be monitoring um, the chat area on Zoom. Uh, so the, um, when there are appropriate points to stop or at the end, um, I'll read the questions so that Pazit can address them. Um, and I think that's all I have for an introduction. Uh, so we'd like to turn this over to Pazit, and we're very happy to have her join us today. Thank you, Reba, and thanks, everybody. Um, silver lining for COVID is that I get to visit you without having to leave my bedroom. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> this invitation would not have been possible a year ago, and so I'm trying to find the good things in COVID. And I also want to let you know that I checked because I was not gonna be in Fairbanks, but I wanted to check Fairbanks out. And when I did the Google, it came out as the 30 worst cities with the worst weather. So congratulations, you have a claim to fame there and my condolences. I thought I was having it difficult with my 40, cells, 40 Fahrenheit. So I'm gonna just share my screen. You'll see the PowerPoint and can go along with it. Um, do, 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 share screen. All right, do you see it? Can you see my screen? Yes. And now do you see the PowerPoint? I switched to slideshow format. Yes. Yes. Good. So I just wanted to share this very nifty logo I have with the circle and the name villages in the center. Um, a volunteer helped me design this logo and I love it so much. I just slap it anywhere I can. I think it speaks so much about what we're trying to communicate. Um, so I'm gonna share this little cartoon, which I think you'll appreciate. These two guys sitting on the bench and one says they set me down and said, Pops, we need to talk about aging in place. I said, aging in place of what? And I just love that cartoon so much because only people who are thinking about aging place understand the humor behind it. Because really, there is very little in place of aging in place. So what does that mean, aging in place? I think that gets tossed around a lot, aging at home, aging in community, aging in place. And I think that it is a really complex term and I wanted to touch on it for a little while. So, most people think that aging at home or aging in place simply means you're just gonna keep on keeping on. You're gonna stay at your home, do the things you've done so far that worked pretty well for the past 30, 40 years and just enjoy the status quo. 
but I'd like to suggest that aging in place should really be a call to action because of the changing uh, that aging brings with it. The question should be, what would it take? What would it take for us to successfully age at home? And the answers are complex and I think depend on where you live and what your life circumstances are. But I'm gonna to touch on some of those aspects so that you'll be able to then reflect on your own life and see where you stand. The first one I touch on is the built environment. I don't know what Fairbanks is like and I wish I did. Um, homes here in the county, I think are maybe 90% inaccessible. So if you reach a point where you are not able to navigate stairs, you find yourself in a conundrum about what to do. And it takes something as simple as a fall. Um, one of my dearest neighbors back in Tacoma Park had fallen, broken her hip, and that was the last time she saw the inside of her house because there are about 20 steps just to get into the house, not to mention the fact that the, her bedroom was in the second floor. And so thinking about those aspects is really important, as well as the public spaces. Does your community have sidewalks, ramps, benches to rest? All these things affect your ability to age at home. Health is, of course, a given. Do we have access to workforce that understands the aging process? I don't know about Fairbanks, but we have a significant shortages of geriatricians and home care workers, and people really scramble when they reach that point that they need those services. Have we made the changes in our lifestyle and health habits that are necessary to accommodate for the aging process? Big issue that really is a whole presentation onto itself. Issue of mobility, as you uh, probably see villages and, and organizations such as yours help individuals who can no longer drive. You find volunteers to help people ride. But what if there wasn't an organization like this and you couldn't drive anymore? What if you lived in a very rural community and you could no longer get anywhere? You become a prisoner in your own home. And so it requires some thought and preparation ahead of time to think about those issues. Financial is the biggie. I think I saw some statistics that most Americans are not really prepared financially for retirement. Most people do not have enough money necessary to support themselves through their aging years. And social, and I think that I left it the last because I think that connects us to what we're talking about today. And I think there hasn't been enough attention paid to the importance of building social network and social connections. And I'm gonna del delve into this in my next slides. Any questions about this slide or anything else I've said so far? Nope, good, I'm gonna breeze right through. So this slide, I created that as a result of many, many, many conversations I've had with people across the county and our county is quite diverse geographically. We have people living in cities in suburbia, as well as some pretty significant rural parts. And the themes that came out from these conversations, I tried to summarize here. What we're seeing is uh, a change in the way we have lived our lives over the past few decades. And we haven't accounted for the losses we're we experiencing. And what do I mean by that? When we built suburbia and we built cities, we didn't really plan for community life. And community life requires spaces to congregate around. And we interact with physical spaces in many in subtle ways. For example, I'll give you one example. If my house is large and lovely, but is built on the back of my, my property, and I have no front porch, and I have um, hedges in front of me, there's no chance I'm gonna see anybody of my neighbors. I will never have a chance to interact with them. But if my, my building, my home is right in front of the road and I have a front porch and I like to sit there on my little rocking chair and watch people walk by as they walk the dogs, then I am already creating opportunities for engagement. And so these things are subtle, but yet have profound impact on how we interact with one another. And if we build our cities and our communities in a way that does not foster that, we're losing something really important. The second, second element is the transfer to two income economy. We created this vacuum in our communities. In the past, I'm not saying it was ideal, I'm just noting the fact that women were not necessarily in the workforce and they were the one that built the social infrastructure of communities. They weren't idle at the house, they took care of kids, they, they connected, they, they were the essential community. They created those networks without even intentionally doing so, it just happened organically. 
So when women left the house to the workforce, we've created these essentially suburban deserts where nobody's around during the day. Unless you retired or you have a disability, you don't work, you walk down the street and there's literally no one there. Another issue that we're seeing is in connection to this economy is that people have two hubs of networks that they're invested in. One is their workforce, workplace. You go to work, you work all day. You spend all your time with your social um, networks through your professional life. And then you come home and you're busy with whoever your nuclear family you have, and you don't have many other social networks with the exception of faith communities, and those have declined significantly. So participation in organized religion has declined a lot. So we have created these two very robust social networks, but what happens when you retire? Your kids leave the house, they go move off somewhere else to Indiana to find a better future, and your work friends are moving on to do other things, and you realize that, oh my God, I don't know anybody. Who are my friends? I might have two or three or four, but it really is then becomes pretty apparent that there is no community around you. And the, the two other elements that I wanted to integrate is that we as a country, as a society, have failed to recognize the value of community living. We, so, we put so much emphasis on individual rights and individualism and about fulfilling yourself and, and taking care of yourself and picking yourself up but the bootstraps and all those idioms that we have failed to recognize that the most important truth of our lives is that we are social animals. We need each other, all of us, regardless of our age. And that's something that we haven't paid attention to. We haven't invested in it. We haven't um, seen the monetary value because you don't pay for it and it doesn't cost any money and you, you don't make any money from communities. So nobody knows what, what is the value of community. Even for example, when we talk about caregiving, that's kind of my pet peeve. When you think about caregiving, the big lead that people talk about it in the public health sphere is the cost of caregiving. You know, it costs the market this many billions of dollars for caregiving, but that's not really what caregiving is all about. That's just, just the way we are failing to recognize true value of, of issues that are not monetized. And so because we haven't invested in things, we've let it um, disintegrate. And now we find ourselves up a creek. And I think a lot of what we're seeing in our country is, some, is somewhat related to that, that we have failed to invest in our communities, in our connections with one another. And so I think organizations such as yours and all over the country, people are realizing that things are not going well. They remember the way things used to be in the past and they're trying to recreate. And I call it the reweaving of the social fabrics of our communities. And that's what you're all about essentially. And that's what makes you so unique and wonderful and so important. So another component, which is really important for this conversation is ageism. And ageism is insidious and very difficult to uh, identify, especially because a lot of people internalize those images of what, is, what ageism is. And this slide is, brings me joy every time I bring it up because the number of nods and affirmation I get from audiences is just lovely. So it's a statement of what aging is rather than whatever other people think about it. It's an opportunity, not a crisis. You know, it's not the great tsunami. It is a solution to many of what we see in the communities and not the problem. Aging individuals are the assets to our societies and our communities and not the burden. They are the resource rather than the drain on the resource. And aging individuals are groups that can make social, economic, cultural, spiritual contributions rather than simply an expansion of the expanding portion of the population. And when you look at civic engagement, I always pay attention to people who come to protests, to uh, contribution of volunteer events, to who coordinates even spiritual life. Who are the leaders in the different churches and temples and mosques I visit? It's mostly the older adults. And so I think um, reminding people that this is an important um, fact of life and that people need to change their attitudes around what aging is, is for themselves and for people around them. And so this is something that I just wanted to talk about. I'm mentioning the word villages, but as Reba had said, villages is just a term people use uh, around the country 
to uh, identify with this movement of people who are creating grassroots community organizations to support each other as the, we age at home. And a couple of key components for what I call community healing that villages and other organizations can bring. It is an exercise in democracy. Um, we're not, it's not a paternalistic approach to what services people need. It's people who are creating, it's uh, for the people, by the people. It really is a democratic process. And when I help uh, villages start up, I emphasize that point that there's gonna be a lot of views and people are not necessarily going to agree about what the community is gonna do and how it's going to feel and what are the driving values. But that's what democracy is all about. It's about bringing a variety and a diversity of opinions and being able to hear each other, not necessarily agree all the time because that's gonna be boring, but being able to find a common ground, a consensus, and even if not everybody agrees, go with the majority. So it is sort of building these local grassroots democratic communities. And as I've said, mentioned before, the, the value of what villages do beyond the services they offer is that they are reweaving the lost social infrastructure locally. In some community organization I work with go beyond the aging uh, population within their neighborhoods and cities and reach out to other generations and become intergenerational. In organizations such as yours and villages are vehicles for advocacy and volunteerism. What can you do for your community? What can you advocate for on behalf of other older adults who might not have the level of organizing capacity as you do? Locally, villages have been very vocal in talking to county uh, government, to state government, um, asking for change, making sure things don't get become worse when budget cuts happen, uh, explaining what villages are so that legislators understand and support them. And so there's a lot you can do when you come together. I always tell people it's kind of a subversive message, but if you're just one person experiencing your own aging drama, you feel a little isolated and helpless, but when you come to a group of people and everybody validates your experiences, you become a voice as a group. And when you come as a group and as an organization to legislators, they listen. So you have power. And you also have the ability to be flexible. I've seen organizations change dramatically the way they do things because they saw the need change or someone comes with a really good idea and they have no trouble pivoting or adding something. And this nimbleness and, and ability to adapt is critical for the success of your organization. So these are the key uh, points for the reason that I'm so passionate about doing this work with you and for you and for uh, supporting the Village to Village Network that is uh, trying to help villages start up all over the country. So with that, I will end and I'm happy to have a conversation with you about your observations and your ideas and your questions. Oh, one more thing, I forgot about that. Do you have more time? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, so um, COVID has really thrown a wrench into everything we did. Everything changed for all of us all over. No one was spared. And I think it was important to consider this, as I've said in the beginning, silver linings, that there's some problems with it for sure. And that the list is gonna be very much longer than probably the one I've written here, but also recognize the opportunities and see what this situation is bringing to our communities and what, how can we leverage and not let a good challenge go to waste. So in risks, of course, older adults do suffer higher mortality rates. And now it's become clear that it's related more to uh, chronic conditions rather than age itself. And I know at least, I swear, scout on are not lying, uh, people over the age of 100 who had COVID and healed and are perfectly fine right now. So just you know, putting that in perspective, I'm sure you would appreciate that. Um, the increased isolation is something that we are extremely concerned about in our county. It's one of those issues that we've never been able to fully or ever will um, crack this nut of isolation because it's sort of a self-perpetuating situation. People isolate themselves so you don't know how to reach them. And so they become even more isolated. And so it, this is just very challenging, um, especially individuals right now who have um, limited technical capacities to join via Zoom. And we've seen the, the difference between people who have been on technology platform before, even if not completely savvy, 
but said, okay, I guess I need to just figure this out and jump on board and got some support and we're able to remain connected just like you are right now. But if people have always been averse to technology and have not um, made that leap, they're having a much harder time remaining connected to everybody else around them. So this is really difficult. Um, access to healthcare. I just got information from my own primary care physician informing us that they're completely overwhelmed and that we shouldn't expect a response <laughs> anytime soon. And I think people who have chronic conditions are finding it extremely difficult to manage it in the time that this pandemic is taking over many health resources, not to mention the concern around going to doctors. I mean, you can appreciate that. I'm not gonna delve into that. And a lot of that leads to increased depression and anxiety rates. And I don't know if you've seen the stats, but there is significant um, sharp increases in depression, anxiety, and suicidality among all age groups, all of them. Although older adults are found to be having um, higher level of resilience, I think people who've lived enough, I think have developed by now um, abilities to cope with situation that younger people might not have had the chance to do so yet. And the opportunities I think is, is what I've seen locally. I don't know how Fairbanks is, but when people could no longer work and kids were out of school and they saw all these need around them, they were organically moved to create solutions locally, especially around food. I've seen a nonprofit that is coming out of my son's high school. It's called Teens Helping Seniors. They've now since become a nonprofit and they've organized to deliver groceries and meals and other uh, services to older adults who are isolated at home. And so I, I'm seeing a lot of those neighborly um, initiatives to take ownership over people's relationship with their neighbors and check in on them and make sure they're okay. So I think that's incredibly heartening and, and uh, increase my optimism and faith in humanity and all that good stuff. And we all see increase in volunteerism, um, especially, I mean, since COVID I have done work with my villages, but also I've worked on food insecurity in this emergency management style and have seen so many people come together to deliver so much food. It's just unbelievable what's happening out there. Um, and I think the increase in technology is cool. It's gonna stay with us. I already had a few people telling me that they like Zoom so much, they not, do not plan on ever showing up to one of my meetings ever again. <laughs> they wanna avoid the traffic and the, the parking stress and just show up in their bedroom and turn on Zoom and be happy. So I think there's potential here to develop um, accessibility. And in addition to that, some people have been telling me something really nice that individuals that were not participating in their organization, so village or, or organization's event before because they're homebound, now are on equal footing like everybody else. Everyone's home and we're just all longing on. And so they were actually having greater access to their organization than they had before. So, you know, there are good things coming out of this stuff. Now I think I'm really done. Yes, done. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And I wanna thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Pazi. I'm not seeing any questions in chat. Uh, so if you would like to unmute yourself and just go ahead and ask verbally, Pazi, any questions that you have or share any comments, uh, please go ahead. I think uh, oh, yeah. Terry, yeah, Terry has her hand up. Or maybe not. Okay. This is Mary Ann, and I did write something in, but maybe it wasn't in the chat box. Maybe it was somewhere else. But um, you were talking about um, the digital technology problems, and that is a problem for some folks. And also for many people, um, as you heard right at the beginning, they have problems because internet access is not available outside yep. of town very well. Is that happening everywhere? Yes. Or, yes. 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 I think here we have less, less to, a, to a lesser extent, but I think that is a significant issue. There's an entire part of the county that is not connected to the broadband and there's just no internet. It's a Do big you know deal. of any governments that are, are helping with that? I mean, we're, we assume that we have to rely on the private companies, the, the providers. Well, to here's what I will say is when I, I mentioned advocacy, mm -hmm. if aging at home Fairbanks wants to meet with these legislators, 
and says, you guys need to use your power to push those private providers to increase internet access, then you're becoming a part of the solution. And you can find your partners and other organization who might have a vested interest in doing the similar advocacy so that you, then you can raise some hell around it. I have already talked to a few legislators and I, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. I, we should do that, yeah. Yep. Yeah, just one other comment about mm -hmm. your COVID, COVID comments. Um, I found too that with Zoom, I have low vision, so I'm not driving as much as I used to and um, getting to meetings and, and things is a little more difficult for me, especially in the dark, which it is quite often up here in the wintertime, many hours a day. So um, this is really great because I can attend without, um, without having to go anywhere and worry about relying on someone else to drive me. So that's an advantage too for yeah. using this kind of a facility well, to, to get I will work. say one thing in response to what you're saying. If you choose to stay at home and continue to participate virtually, that's fantastic. But something you said uh, about not having to rely on someone to drive you, I think that if you wanted to show up in, present, in, in person, there'd be many people who would be delighted to drive you because that's what a community does for one another. And that and very I, mindset, and I think it's really important because that very mindset of not feeling comfortable asking for help from one another is holding us back from becoming a true community. And the joy that you're giving other people by uh, allowing them to volunteer and give you a ride is really incredible. And that's something that I think we all need to remember that there's a time to receive help and a time to ask for help and both of them are equally as valuable and important. So if you ever wanted to go someplace. I know, and we have the volunteers and I know we have volunteers who say, I don't have anything to do, nobody's asking. But the, exactly. our, volunteer, our volunteers have been great and, and I have gotten a lot of rides okay, great. from our volunteers. I just wanted to put it out there. Did uh, Mary Matthews have a question? Someone is sharing their screen and I think you need to Okay, stop. there there I am. Um, yes, my question has to do with um, safety from because of the COVID and mm -hmm. how much we can have um, contact with uh, our volunteers and community members and still and still be safe because we've yeah. kind of cut back on our our volunteer part of the program because the people aren't in our bubble. People yeah. in the community aren't in our bubble. Yeah, so that is a very difficult question. Um, some of our villages have ramped up their volunteer driving programs slowly and gradually after COVID put a halt onto everything. And one of our most robust volunteers in one of the villages called um, his founding uh, president to tell her that he had been exposed to COVID through one of the people he had given a ride to. Hey. Mm. And that completely threw everything to a screeching halt. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. I, it's such a tough question. Mm -hmm. I do not think we need to promote any additional unnecessary exposures amongst ourselves during COVID. This is a crazy pandemic. Nothing is normal. I've seen some villages find creative solutions. One of the solutions Silver Spring does, which I really like, is buddy up a volunteer and a member and have them become a part of a bubble. So that a volunteer says, I know that I'm not gonna be offering uh, services to the entire community, but I have Mrs. Smith. And when Mrs. Smith needs a service, I'm her go-to person. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And so you're mitigating exposure significantly. You can incorporate uh, frequent testing if needed or other precautions. So I'm not saying nothing should be done, um, and I will never endorse any practice that would expose anyone to risk. I think this is the, the risk tolerance level should be dictated by your organization and perhaps finding um, younger people who are not at risk could be a solution. Although we're seeing younger people with no prior conditions get very, very ill. Um, so it's really tricky. We even have the struggle with people who need to go to see their doctor. They cannot do telehealth for whatever reason. They have to see their doctor and they have no way to get there. So we're gonna abandon them. What are we gonna do? 
And these are really, really difficult questions. Um, and some villages have bought these uh, plexiglass to separate the front and the back. I don't know if you've talked about that in your organization. And they have these kits they give to volunteer driver with, uh, you know, masks and covers and, and gloves and san hand sanitizers to uh, mitigate the risk. Um, but I think that you, we need to recognize the inherent risk of exposure if we do anything. And Thank see you. how, yeah, it's, ah. Uh, Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Chrissy. I, yeah. I think we'll. Uh, it, I think we've had questions. And shall we move on? It's your call. I'm at your service for however long you want me. Is that okay, Reba? Yes. Yeah. We really appreciate your help <laughs> and all your insights, Pazit, um, and wish you all the best in the suburban uh, DC, um, Montgomery County, Maryland. There. You're welcome. And we're <laughs> planning some events, so you guys might be able to join some of our regional events because now we can just join by Zoom. So stay tuned to Village to Village announcement to things we're gonna to do together. Thank you, that's great to hear. Great. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you everybody. I'm gonna log off, okay? Okay, yeah, it's Thank late you. your time. Yes. <laughs> Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Okay, everyone would like to uh, have a very quick poll. Uh, if Joy can uh, put it up for us, it'll be on screen. You pick a, uh, an answer and we'll have poll results in no time. After you make your choice, submit it. And the poll is, what is the best part about getting old? It's multiple choice, beats the alternative, senior shopping discounts, not working, or all of the above. Okay, I still, there are still uh, uh, poll results coming in. We already have 30 responses and uh, we'll give it another <laughs> few seconds to put in your response. And I think we're done. So uh, Joy, could you take care of uh, showing us the results? Okay, all of the above was the top choice. Uh, then we have beats the alternative, 35% chose that. Uh, and then not working, 23% of our people. And then senior shopping discounts, 10%. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, is that off the screen now? Okay, uh, now we get to um, our first uh, door prize drawing. And uh, let's see, Marianne, uh, would you introduce that? Okay, I finally got myself unmuted. Um, Yes, door prizes. We always had so much fun at Raven Landing where we could see who the prize was going to and everything. Today, um, Pam is keeping track of the names and is going to draw the names. Um, Joy, could you put the first slide up? We have a lot of donors for our door prizes today. Some gift certificates and some goodies. So, um, there we go. We've got uh, donations from Lemongrass, uh, Forget-Me-Not Books, Sipping Streams Tea Company, The Pita Place, Judy Triplehorn, Pam Wagaman, myself, Donna Dinsmore, and Cheryl Keepers. So um, wonderful prizes. As you know, we can't just hand them to you today, but once um, the meeting is over, we will contact each of the winners and arrange for delivery. So you will get it, it may not be today. It will not be today probably. So um, if you could go on to the next slide. 
Okay, we're going to do this in two batches. And the first uh, door prize drawing is um, this group. So the first thing is a plate of Christmas cookies. Donna does beautiful Christmas cookies every year. So um, the Christmas cookies drawing. Pam, do you have a name? Sorry, I had to unmute first. Okay, I've got names in here. I probably have a few names that shouldn't be in here, but we'll know. Okay, first one for the plate of cookies, I've got Margaret Van Flyn. Okay, great. There you go. Margaret, you get the cookies. And the next one is a gift certificate from Forget Me Not Books. Okay, gift certificate. Books. Cliff Lando. Okay, books are always good when we have to be hunkering down. Uh, and we have a tea sampler, sampler of 15 different kinds of teas from Sipping Streams. Linda Distad. Linda, great. Okay, and the next one is a bowl of special pecans. Special pecans go to Nan Myers. Congratulations, Nan. And the last one for this group is a gift certificate from the PETA place on College Road. Oh, yum. Reba, did you want to be in the drawing? Reba. Yeah, she should be in the drawing yeah, too. I, I think. have to yes. unmute. Yes, so Reba. Ah, thank you. Um, I don't think Cliff's here in the meeting. Okay, you want me to pull another one out? Well, I don't think he's here. I don't I, I didn't I see don't, him join. I don't think so either. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So I think I think you should. <laughs> okay, I'll give get the rid books of that to one. someone else. The books go to Janet Matheson. <clears throat> okay. Great. So we will do the next four um, whenever Joy puts us in the meeting here. So great. Back to you, Barbara. Okay, uh, we're now ready for our annual report. And it has indeed been a, uh, quite a year. Um, we certainly miss our in-person contacts and, and activities, but we've come to realize that there are other ways to stay connected and to be with other people. And that's been very interesting. We see that, uh, as Bazit said, one of the benefits of uh, aging at home Fairbanks is that we do have a community. We have connections with other people. And uh, thanks to uh, a lot of the work that Joy has done, we get lots of information. We've had lots of new activities. I personally like uh, going to a Tai Chi class without having to drive anywhere. So there are a lot of good things that have come out of this and we hope that they'll continue. Uh, Joy is first going to um, tell us about some of the activities we've had this year, some of the events, and then Ariba, our treasurer, will go over our financial state at this point. So uh, let's see. Why don't we have Joy telling us about what, what's happened this year so far? So that's a lot of information on this slide, but Basically, the main thing that I think is really cool is that we'll have a total of 59 events by the end of the year, which is a lot of events, One, obviously. Um, we and what I, another number that I think is interesting, so between April 14th and August 29th, we had 19 events. That's more than one event a week. So, you know, we've been having a lot of events. We've had tried to, you know, we've had some happy hours and obviously we don't have lunch anymore. 
And then one of the cool things that we're working on are these, we're calling them ZIGs, Zoom interest groups. And as Barbara mentioned, she's part of the Tai Chi for Health. So we have different ones that we've started, the first three, and some meet weekly, some meet every two weeks, some meet monthly. And then we've got um, two more, uh, Marvin's uh, working on something, remembering local history, and um, Marianne's interest in a low vision group. So we thought we those are probably gonna start in the new year. And if anybody has any other ideas, um, yeah, just uh, shoot us an email or shoot me an email or give me a call. Um, these are things that people might just be interested in meeting and talking about. We had our first cooks challenge yesterday and it was really nice. I'm gonna send out a, uh, some information about the meeting. It, it's, gonna, it's gonna be really fun. And uh, yeah, and as some people know, and I'll be sending out a uh, reminder, but Friday, uh, Krista from Ollie, some of you guys might know her, she's gonna cut her hair on Zoom so she can teach us how to cut hair. And Monday we have that uh, Good Reads group. And on Tuesday, Sarah Patterson, who is who used to work in palliative care at uh, FMH is gonna be giving us a talk about the Advanced Health Care Directive. And all that will be coming via email. And then uh, service calls and volunteers. Up to now we've had 61 service requests so even during COVID, you know, we had people, we have had people removing snow, picking up groceries, driving members, stacking wood, reading mail, various types of things. So even though we're not doing indoor services, we still have outdoor services. And just a quick, um, I think we only have one volunteer on here today. So thanks, Ruth. Um, but we have 25, we have 44 total volunteers, uh, 25 of which are non-members and 19 are members. So that's kind of what we got going on this year. That is all. If anyone. Okay. Uh, Reba, would you like to tell us about finances? I sure would. <laughs> <laughs> um, for our income, we uh, just have two sources of income. One is donations and the other is our membership dues. Uh, we've been really lucky to have a lot of um, generous people donate to us this year. Um, and we thank those and I hope they won't mind me mentioning their names at the bottom of this slide. Um, we received donations from Sandy Dauenhauer, Donna Dinsmore, Linda Distad, Mary Matthews, Renee Sexton and Josie Wooding. And those are very much appreciated. Um, and they, these donations uh, often help us with our membership assistance fund uh, to help those members with lower incomes. Um, the bulk of our income is our membership dues. I need to say that our fiscal year hasn't ended yet. It won't end until the end of December. Uh, so I'm doing some estimating here, but I'm estimating 22,500 uh, to be received. Uh, from membership dues, which would give us a total income of 23,325. And if you could go on to the next slide. These are our expenses. And I won't run, I won't take the time to run through line by line each expense. Um, and again, there are some estimates here, but overall, um, our, our mailings, printing and supplies expenses have gone down this year. We're not doing as much with, uh, with COVID and not spending time in the office. Um, our payroll expenses are also somewhat down and we've been helped with that um, because the North Star Council on Aging and the Senior Center did receive a CARES Act payroll protection program grant, and that applied to our two employees as well. And so we have saved approximately $1,950 in payroll expenses this year. And that's been a big help. Um, let's see, our, and the other thing I want to point out is that our uh, telecommunications costs are up because, of course, we're Zooming a lot. Um, but this gives an estimate of total expenses of $22,573. And that's a little more, or excuse me, that's a little less than our income. That uh, means we have roughly a little over $700 expected as a gain in income. Um, so overall, 
There might be some changes in that, but we're pretty much breaking even this year, which I think is very good uh, in spite of COVID. Uh, and our membership has stayed really stable this year. So very good things. And that's it. Okay, thank you, Reba. Uh, since we're talking about finances and the uh, Senior Center, uh, I noticed that Darlene Supley, the uh, director of the Senior Center has joined us. Darlene, if you uh, unmute for a second and say hello, you'll be the focus on our screens. Well, hello, everybody. What a, what a, a lovely Zoom annual meeting. Um, that uh, when North Star Counseling on Aging, when I first met Barb, um, I thought that this was a very wise um, uh, a community um, organization that uh, started, what was it, five years ago now, Barb? Yes. And that, um, and so it, aging us home has just been an amazing gift. And we are so um, honored to be part of uh, the journey and the membership and what you do and watching you all just continue to grow with the COVID Zoom requirements. And I love getting the emails that talks about all of your classes. And it's just a, it's just a joy. It's a joy to watch you all organize and be part of a family and take care of each other. And so thank you for allowing me to be included in with that. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's see. I think we'll go back to um, sharing screen here and we'll, Go on to our next treat, which is our second Dora Prize drawing. Uh, so Pam, can you tell us uh, who are the lucky winners are for these? The first um, on our list for this group is a beautiful Japanese block print calendar, a wall calendar. Really nice. And did I unmute? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, the winner of this one is Goldie Southwood. Great. Okay, and another Forget-Me-Not Books gift certificate. Okay, another books. Dinah Nasky. Congratulations, Dinah. And the next is a biscotti gift bag, homemade biscotti from Pam. Biscotti goes to Sandy Benson. And that's great. Uh, sorry, I'm writing at the same time as a, we're oh, talking wow. here. <laughs> um, figured it's better if several of us write these down. Yeah. Um, so Sandy Benson gets the biscotti and the last is a lemongrass Thai cuisine gift certificate. And that goes to Ruth Natman. Congratulations, Ruth. Okay, so we, um, those are the, give the door prizes for this, this year. Um, as I said, all door prize winners will be contacted so that we can get the, the gifts to you. Uh, we may mail the gift certificates and make sure that we deliver the others. We don't know yet. Depends on where you live and where the items are located because they're still on our individual homes. Um, but also, I'm, and Barbara will probably mention this, but um, as you saw in an email, uh, gift for everybody is the $25 discount on your membership renewal this next next time. So um, that's just fifth anniversary gift for, for all members. And then for volunteers, if they choose to um, join, they will also get uh, $25 off the cost of joining. And this is Ruth, thank you for my gift certificate. You're welcome. Enjoy. Well, that, that brings us to the end of our, our business part. Uh, 
the only thing that's remaining is a, a slideshow of photos from the last five years. And, uh, you know, nothing else uh, that requires your participation. If, if you need to go, feel free to do so. Uh, the slideshow will take about nine minutes and we'll, uh, most of us will hang on. And if you'd like to chat afterwards, please stay. So it'll be about nine minutes uh, and uh, photos from the past. And let me get, see if I can get to it.